Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Onc Live Peer Exchange panel discussion on the topic of multiple myeloma. These are exciting times in the field of multiple myeloma research, with several new agents approved by the FDA in 2015. However, along with this unprecedented progress comes increased complexity in terms of choosing the best course of therapy for an individual patient. In this Onc Live Peer Exchange, I'm joined by a panel of experts in the field of myeloma. Today, we will discuss how the changes in NCCN guidelines and the introduction of new data from the ASCO 2016 meeting will affect routine clinical practice. My name is Dr. Keith Stewart, and I'm the Vasic and Anna Maria Pollock Professor of Cancer Research at the Mayo Clinic. Participating today on our distinguished panel is Dr. Bill Bensinger, Chief of the Myeloma Program at the Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Raphael Fonseca, the Getz Family Professor of Cancer and the Chair of the Department of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Dr. Ola Langren, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Myeloma Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And of course, Dr. Jayton Shah, Associate Professor of Medicine at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us, and let's get started. I wanted to start perhaps by uh, talking about uh, some changes in how we think about who actually has myeloma in the first place that may or may not require therapy. And Dr. Langren, I'm looking at you, Ola, because you've, you've been quite active in this field. And can you explain to the audience what's changed recently and who we think actually has myeloma that needs therapy? Well, I think uh, that's a very important question, Keith. Uh, there are new Def new parts of the definition for myeloma that needs to be really emphasized. It used to be a disease defined by symptoms with the old CRAB criteria. Patients used to have either hypocalcemia, renal failure, anemia, or bone lesions, and typically that manifested with symptoms. But with the new definition, we have uh, biomarkers that also makes it a diagnosis. And the three biomarkers that are part of the criteria include light chains in the blood. Uh, if the light chain ratio is greater than 100, and the one that's elevated, the involved one, is more than 10 milligrams per deciliter, that would also make it myeloma requiring therapy by guidelines. The second one is if the plasma cell infiltration in the marrow is greater than 60%. Again, multiple myeloma requiring therapy. And the third one would be if MRI is conducted of the spine and the pelvis, or for the whole body, uh, if two or more focal areas are found, two focal areas of the marrow or the bone, again, multiple myeloma requiring therapy. So you don't have to have symptoms. Does it have to be an MRI? Can a PET scan do the same thing, or a skeletal survey? So by the new criteria, uh, the bone lesions, as part of the CRAB criteria, could be done either by X-ray or PET-CT. At my institution, we have implemented PET-CT as the, the method of choice. Uh, so that would focus on bone lesions. So MRI would capture also changes in the marrow where the PET-CT is not really the ideal. And how many patients are reclassified as having myeloma based on this, you know, marrow plasma cytosis, high free light chain, bone lesion? How many move from being smoldering to needing treatment? So the literature is not entirely clear because the number of patients that have been worked up to, to address that question I think is still not very, very large. Right. I think a round number is probably around 30% of patients that are previously called smoldering. They probably fall into the category of multiple myeloma requiring therapy based on these biomarkers. So we're gradually moving back a little bit in who we think needs active therapy. And there was a presentation yesterday from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Fonseca, Rafael. Um, for those patients who don't meet criteria but you're following over time, what did you think of that? It, it, it would use some pretty simple techniques, uh, sure. following hemoglobin, and what, what, tell us about that. Well, you know, it, it was a very interesting presentation. I don't think it's definitive, but it's one of the first times that we're looking at this in a dynamic way. All of our classifications have been static. So we just take a number of parameters, number of biomarkers, and we estimate a risk. But of course, in the real world, we follow patients and we see what happens over time, and that's what we now call clinical judgment or criteria. So essentially the Mayo study looked at patients who had repeated sampling and data on smoldering, and they looked at two variables which are obviously uh, uh, variables that we would be worried about, an increase in the monoclonal protein, in, in their case in the study 0.5, or a decrease in hemoglobin um, by 0.5. And then if you start mixing that with some other markers such as plasma cytosis in the excess of 
you actually are able to stratify the smoldering patients. So I, I don't think it's a definitive study, but it's certainly a very important step forward so that seems, in the real world seems, we can uh, adapt. It seems kind of simplistic. I mean, you're, isn't it already true that when we're following a smolder myeloma and you see the hemoglobin dropping and the protein rising that you're likely to start therapy at some point? Well, well, it is true, but it's just a validation of what we're seeing in the clinic. And I think it's an objective way of saying, in fact, how you're applying your clinical judgment does make sense. Up to this point, it's been a badge of honor to be conservative in myeloma. We always live by the mantra, you don't want to treat too early. But of course, we don't want to treat too late. And I think the studies are taking us to that point. I, that I always we want think to you, would, you would never leave a breast cancer untreated. I always worry about, wonder why we, why we, why don't we treat all of our smoldering myelomas, Jane? What, what's the... So it's important because I think it's important to understand why we have these new criteria as well. So the criteria that Ola laid out, I think were very specific because they've identified patients who are, have a higher likelihood of progression in the next 18 to 24 months. So those are the reasons why we came up with that criteria. And if we look at other patients, they may not progress out till nine or 10 years. And so for those patients, may not need therapy. So I think that if we can identify the subset of patients that are progressing in a very short time frame, 12, 18, 24 months. The high risk population. The high risk population. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense now to target those patients in particular. And just one comment about just the free light chain ratio, again, speaking to the dynamic process of this, you know, if we look at MRI lesions or the bone marrow plasma cytosis, I think that we all feel comfortable with that. The only caveat that I have clinically is sometimes a free light chain ratio can go up in the setting of a renal dysfunction or anemia right. or, or yeah. sorry, infection or vaccination. So if your patient just had this and came in with a one-time incidence, I think it's important if you have a low bone marrow plasma cytosis and nothing else, that if it's only based on the free light chain ratio, maybe to recheck that again in a few weeks if it's due to some recent infection, because sometimes we can see that because it could be rather volatile.